Welcome to the Loins of History, a podcast connecting the past to the present and doing our best to connect to correct historical and political illiteracy. I'm Colin and joined by my co-host Jay. We've got a great episode today where we're going to continue our China series. And last week we spoke about Deng Xiaoping and the modernization of China and making deals with the devil. And so with, with that, Jay is going to start leading us into a discussion on Xi Jinping and some of the reforms that he's done. So Jay, can you start us off? and kind of recap where we left off last week and then where you want to drive the show this week. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Colin. So we're we're tied on this episode, Xi Jinping and Cold War II, because that's very much where we're at. The Cold War, I think that's a good way to put it. Cold War II. I mean, if if you read the news about anything that's happening outside of our own political system, everything seems to be tied to China in some way or another, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's Russia, there's always this element of China being involved. And yeah. Obviously, they, you know, we talked last week, our economies at this point are so intertwined that we can't do anything without affecting each other. So it's, you know, the Cold War is a good way to put it, especially because we are, it's, you know, we're feeling climate change in that Cold War. It's getting a little warmer. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the the first global Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States and NATO uh, on the whole was very much characterized by like, hey, I don't like you, you don't like me, but we believe that like military conflict is not in either of our best interests. So we're just gonna kind of compete against one another uh, for various things and we'll see who wins at the end of the day. That is very much the relationship that we've entered now uh, between the United States and China, we, you know, we kind of talked about this era of good feelings last week, increased trade, increased diplomatic cooperation. And then with Tiananmen Square, with, you know, the, the Trump era trade war and with intellectual property theft, et cetera, things were definitely beefing again. And then there's this little issue over Taiwan. And nobody knows what's going to happen. So the war is not heated up quite yet, but there's always a possibility. So we're gonna we're gonna discuss this new Cold War too, and uh, and talk about why why that's the case. So with that, I'm going to talk about. We've got five main takeaways for this episode. The first one is, you know, kind of continuing the narrative of U.S. Chinese relations history. Number one, under under Xi Jinping, the CCP or Chinese Communist Party has returned to a Mao-like cult of personality and a confrontational approach to the U.S. So, domestically speaking, Xi Jinping has more in common with Mao Zedong than he does with Dang or Hu or Zhang or something like one of those more low-key state premiers who were focused more on what Dang called the moderate prosperity. Xi Jinping is very much about Xi Jinping and including a lot of flattering terms and pop songs, et cetera, bringing back that cult of personality. That's, uh, why, he sec- ha- that's why he hated being compared to Winnie the Pooh so much. Oh, yes. I, I don't know if anybody uh, remembers that, but- it became like a, a very popular meme for like, I don't know, a year. Can't even remember how many years ago it was, but it was like 2020, 2021. He got compared to Winnie the Pooh and he hated it. He loathed yes. it. Yes. And for anyone asking why, why Xi Jinping would be compared to Winnie the Pooh, just Google a picture of the man <laughs> and you will see he does bear a striking resemblance to Winnie the Pooh. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure he loves that. Anyway, uh, number number two here is on the Belt and Road Initiative and how it was one of Xi's main economic slash foreign policy tools to kind of supplant the United States as as the uh, world's foremost economy. And kind of like we mentioned last week and what we'll talk about here in details, when, when the Belt and Road Initiative or the BRI first came out, it kind of had us a little shook. We... We were a little nervous about like, oh man, like this this actually looks like, you know, a threatening thing. But post COVID, 
in taking into light all the other economic woes that China's facing, BRI is very much in on shaky ground. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Number three on more of the U.S. side, beginning under President Trump, but then also continued under President Biden, the U.S. is kind of matching Xi and the CCP's drift towards a confrontational approach. And relations have very much soured since 2017 when Trump took office. And there's been, I mean, it it hasn't been a consistent decline. There's been some wins. There's been some losses. But generally speaking, we are trending downwards uh, in relations between our countries. There's a lot of different topics that we could go into, but we'll try to hit the high notes here. But even from the U.S. perspective, we're, we're also still kind of playing hardball with them. Number four, serious questions remain on the future of the Chinese economy due to a faltering real estate market and lasting impacts from the one-child policy and their zero COVID policy. So the one-child policy being you know, that decades-long policy that Chinese families were only allowed to have one child, which has had significant demographic impacts today. And their zero COVID policy, which they took the lockdown measures that we saw here globally, they took it to the next level. Some of y'all may have, you know, heard about how if if someone was tested positive for COVID, they were literally being welded shut in their uh, apartment complex. They would like take the metal door and weld it shut and people were dying pretty wild some of the stories that were come out of there and then lastly the the fifth main key takeaway here is that taiwan or the republic of china remains the central controversial issue between china and the united states and the most likely cause for conflict in the future so with that we'll get started talking about old xi jinping so Xi Jinping is is a good a good way to kind of wrap up where we've been going in the series. If if our listeners remember last week, we really talked about the increasing cooperation, increasing trade deals, increasing positive relations between the US and China that spanned both Republican and Democrat administrations. It started in the 70s under Nixon. It was carried through Ford and Carter, Reagan, even though Reagan ran on a staunch anti-communist platform and it did get him in trouble a little bit. He, he did say some negative comments as candidate Reagan, to which he later had to apologize for. But while you know his eight years in office, he, his administration still continued the increased cooperation with some, with some caveats in there with, with the Chinese. Um, after Re- after Reagan, of course, we had the Bush administration, and we talked about how even you know Bush spent some time in Taiwan as, at the American Institute for Taiwan. Tiananmen Square happened under his watch, and then later the Clinton administration and how they tied human rights issues with continuing trade. After after the Clinton administration, you know, America did a hard shift to. The global war on terror, you know, we were way more focused on the Middle East and we kind of took our eyes off of China. And this seemed to be okay. But during the Obama administration, a man named Xi Jinping was elected as the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party in 2012. Uh, And then the following year, he was elected the president of the People's Republic of China. And one one quick note here on the the relationship between these two titles here. The People's Republic of China doesn't have a political party. The Communist Party of China has a state. That is that's the the accurate way. The CCP runs the country and it is it is more important to be the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party than it is to be the president of the People's Republic of China. Here in the United States and, and other Western democratic nations, it's kind of the opposite. It's, you know, you be a you're a you're a president, you're a prime minister, or you know, if you're 
still technically a monarchy. You can be a sovereign, but you know, the party politics, except the, except the monarchy part, but like the party politics is what gets you into that seat. But once you're in that seat, you kind of, you're supposed to (laughs) represent every, or, you know, speak and represent the American people, right? China, it's the, it's the opposite of that. The, what actually gets you into power is being the leader of the party. And then the party appoints who it believes should be the president of the country. (laughs) So it's kind of flipped in that role. So he was, she was elected the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party in, in 2012. And then he was elected to be the president in 2013. He is currently, as of October of last year, on his third term, which is kind of unprecedented. Previous predecessors to Xi were also following a two-year model. I believe 68 is the, is the age in which it's kind of expected that you retire. A lot of those norms are going away under Xi, and it's looking like they're they're following the Vladimir Putin model of, oh, I'm elected, and I'm just going to continue to be wink, wink, elected. Uh, so that's where that's where she currently resides. So moving on to some of the key characteristics of Xi's time in office and some of his big initiatives, probably one of the most notable things is the return of the Mao-like cult of personality. Yeah, Jay, that's so it's interesting if when we get into this and how the cult of personality started to go away. And as as a matter of fact, like Deng Xiaoping and his predecessors were not adherents to the cult of personality to the point that they tried to extinguish it. They believed in a more moderate take on a ruler and what their policy should be. So it should be more policy driven versus a personality driven. I think Xi understands because he is so much more authoritarian in comparison to to Dang, he has to maintain a personality in order to maintain popular support because he is cracked out and he's increased government surveillance on the populace. Do you remember his zero COVID policies, things like that? So I think he understands that he has to maintain a cult of personality to counteract some of his most unpopular opinions because Dang tried to move away from Mao. If you remember last week, we talked about him kind of towing this line of like things like private property ownership and his uh, Deng Xiaoping theories. And uh, whereas Xi Jinping sees that, uh, you know, moderate prosperity, some of the private property ownerships as good, it still needs to revolve around a very centrally authoritarian figure. And that is him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how much of it is ego versus how much of it is a, is a, genuine belief that the best way to fix China's problems is to have everyone worship one man like a god and do whatever he says. Like, I... Why not both? I'm, yeah, like, okay, no, great point. Like, does this does the second require a massive ego? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what I'm thinking about? Like, it's... I don't think I think it would be a misunderstanding on our part here in the West if we looked at it and were like, oh, she just has a massive ego. I think it's probably a little bit more accurate to say, like, no, the reason why he's brought back this cult of personality is because he saw, you know, 20, 30 years of increased cooperation with the United States and. Yes, there's been a creation of a middle class within China, like they've made a lot of money, but Taiwan is still kind of doing its own thing. They're still having issues with the Uyghurs. Their economy is still uh, hasn't caught up with the United States and they want more. Almost like Hitler come into power in Nazi Germany, like, you know, Nazi Germany had come back, like their economy had rebounded, but it wasn't enough. If you think about it, we talk about these disputes in the South China Sea and, you know, for the U.S., I think the way Xi sees it is we are not even letting him go outside in his backyard. We have him pinned against yeah. pinned against the wall. You know, he can't even go to the beach. He can't – the waters outside of his own country are not his. So, I think in that regard, there's a bit of an ego strike. But yeah, I think you have to have an ego to command a 
a government set up the way the CCP is or the PRC is with the CCP, you have to have a massive ego. And I think he sees the cult of personality as a way to keep everything under his control. It's just another, I mean, that's what Mao did. I mean, Mao built a cult of personality and he got away with some horrible atrocities because he was able to keep the masses in line and they yeah. followed whatever he did. And that he used the masses as like a bottom up to keep pressure on his political rivals. So, I mean, G's probably trying to kind of hybridize that and take a take a page out of the playbook without fully replicating Mao. But I mean, it is yeah. effective. And if you think, if we look back at the Chinese history, they always had emperors who were revered like gods. Yes. So it's, and you've seen slowly since Deng, a return to, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Mao has right. fused more Confucianism and brought back a lot of the classical Chinese historical figures and learnings and teachings. So it's kind Mao, of like- Mao or Xi? Sorry, Xi, not Mao. Definitely not Mao. Mm. Mao did the opposite. He tried to <laughs> yeah. destroy it. Excuse me. Xi has done this. So- it kind of makes sense for it. He's like, well, I'm a socialist leader. I'm the head of the party. I'm just going to kind of set up myself as this quasi emperor in a way. And it's going to slot right into our, our culture. Yeah. I don't know. She crosses me as someone who is ruthlessly pragmatic. Very, like, very much like Vladimir Putin. And our, in a, you know, our listeners can scroll back to our first three episodes that we did on this podcast were regarding Russia, Ukraine. And we we talked about how Vladimir Putin came to power by essentially, you know, taking advantage of the economic turmoil that was Russia in the 90s and essentially using his cronies from St. Petersburg, you know, giving out benefits and favors and protections to all the right people in all the right places. And he essentially was able to control the elite. In a very real way, Xi Jinping has done the exact same thing in he he gives the elite class within Be uh, Beijing what they want, and they're all too happy to keep him in power as long as he's also given them what they want. And so, so they'll put his they'll put his picture up in uh, Tiananmen Square. No problem, because he's lying in their pocketbooks type deal. Has he has he used like anti-corruption and like his government approval, you know, has he used that as a crack? I guess I'm kind of moving away from the cult of personality, but yeah, yeah. it kind of all goes together with anti-corruption and increased police state. Has no, he right. used that to kind of mold that? Yeah, no. Ab yes. And the anti-corruption campaign, it's kind of funny because is there like legit corruption in China? Absolutely. There's a cultural aspect about China that like like taking a bribe is kind of common. I had a friend a while back who was actually born in Xinjiang and she was saying just to like do basic things, it's very common to just give someone a little bribe just to, you know, get from point A to point B. Uh now that's just like very common in in Chinese culture. So is corruption a thing? Yes. Is it also really convenient to consolidate power within the CCP to just label someone as corrupt? Kind of similar to the the Cultural Revolution, where what was it called? Struggle public struggle sessions. Struggle where sessions, they, yeah. Where they would wear a dunce cap and be forced to admit all the areas in their lives in which they were not good communists. And it was like if they and they could not say, "I think I'm a good communist." It's like no, like they'll stand there for hours and be forced to like confess <laughs> publicly of what of what they've done. Um, and you know that's a really good way. It's it's like this, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't type deal. So these this anti-corruption campaign has been one of Xi's main drivers to eliminate corruption and also consolidate power within the CCP. It's kind of interesting because like you brought up struggle sessions and it's almost like getting into like the surveillance state and social credit, right? Like if I have a poor social credit score, I am unable to do things. And it's kind of like, well, who ultimately decides what your social credit score is? Like, how is that going to be done? Did yeah. you want to talk a little sorry. bit about that? Well, real quick, since you mentioned it, can you explain for us what the social credit score is for those of us that may not be? Well, not too dissimilar from your 
current credit score as the United States. You know, <laughs> if you if we use that as a reference in the United States, you have your credits, your financial credit score, which is basically how banks and financial institutions determine what how they want to loan you money, if they want to loan you money, how financially stable is this person. Now take that same concept, you know, if you do if you pay all your loans on time, your score goes up. If you you know if you have a lot of credit card debt, your score goes down. Now apply that to a social setting where you have this score that is constantly being trafficked. So if you are posting things on social media that are anti-state or there's something in violation and the state determines that that is, you know, gives you a negative rating that is going to lower your social credit score. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take that low social credit score and prevent people, just like if I had a bad credit score in the United States, I couldn't buy a house or I Right. be given a really high interest rate because there's a lot of risk. It's the same thing. If I was in China and I had a low social credit score because I was doing things that were unpopular with the state, yeah. I then am now banned from doing things that I like. So I'm not making those things illegal, but I am simply not allowing, I'm using other institutions to kind of basically constrict a person's freedom you know, within this system that they have set up. So, you can't yeah. just do whatever you want to do. And so, now everything has a subtle repercussion and you're constantly tracking the score. And part of the problem is you don't necessarily know who's determining what is good and what is bad and how badly it's going to affect you. So, you're going to constantly right. strive to do better. Kind of similar to a struggle session, you got to a point where people were professing their love for Mao. And if you didn't do it, if you weren't, you know, you know, enthusiastic enough, you could be accused of of being an imperialist or something like that. Yeah. So now it's like, well, I've got to go even even further. I've got to become a better citizen. So yeah, you know. Well, it's funny you talk about being enthusiastic because one of the things that can increase your social credit score in China is by smiling in public. I believe it was a Washington Post article that reported on this, and it was when I when I read that, it was like. This is this is bizarre world. Like this is this is insane that and and I don't I, I don't know if we've explicitly said it, but like in China, your social credit score impacts your ability to buy food. It impacts the location in which you can live. It impacts where you can go to like schools for your children. You know, it's just like here in the United States. Like not all schools are created equal, and some are better than others. So it's like major decisions, major aspects of life can be determined by what your social credit score is. If you say anything negative about Xi Jinping or the party or the country in general on the internet, on social media, the algorithms pick it up. It impacts your social credit score. If you're found in any infraction of the law, that impacts your so Like it's it's gnarly how many things are tied to the score. And yeah, that's just one example of the increasing authoritarianism under, under Xi uh, in China. Um, one, one more note on internet, increased internet censor, censorship uh, since she took office. If our listeners remember during the COVID lockdowns, there were quite a few protests, and which was surprising to see because you normally don't see protests in China these days. But there were quite a few student protests, and they were many of them were students holding up blank white sheets of paper. The reason why they were holding up these white sheets of paper was because they were basically they were protesting zero COVID policies, but they were also kind of protesting the internet censorship, basically saying like, I've been muzzled and they know that they're not allowed to say anything. So they wouldn't say anything, but by holding up this blank sheet of paper, you're saying something. It's very clever. I like that. And when, when BBC, when Al Jazeera, when CNN starts taking pictures of these protests and all these uh, pictures start making their way into global news media, that makes she and the CCP look bad. And we've talked about it before in this series, the concept of saving face is culturally significant in China. And one of the most damaging things from the Chinese perspective that you can do to the CCP is to embarrass it or to ruin its reputation publicly. So the interesting thing about these those protests and the in, in the white paper aspect of it is it actually worked. Like they actually changed their the the zero COVID policy pretty quickly after that. So 
the internet censorship is very real over in China and you can get disappeared for for saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Yeah, and or if you live in Hong Kong, they can you're talking about protest. I mean, that was one of the big things she did was an absolute crackdown on that was that was right before COVID happened, a couple months, I think. It's yeah. 2019. And yeah, it was it turned into a police state, which is very yeah. different. If you remember, China didn't take it over until what, 1999? It was uh, yeah. still in control of the British. So it's a very westernized city mm-hmm. with, you know, connected to mainland China. So within 20 years, they went from, you know, kind of this Western ideology rule to a police state, essentially. Yeah. And in, in the, in the big crackdown occurred because the the local Hong Kong legislature was basically being forced to pass a law that would re- would enable if anyone in Hong Kong was guilty of you know crimes like criticizing the CCP they could be extradited to mainland you know the rest you know the rest of mainland Chinese courts and that's that caused a whole bunch of protests and the Hong Kong police which you know, was transformed into basically a military police was very ruthless in in suppressing these protests. I didn't see anything like Tiananmen Square style. However, a lot of people also disappeared in Hong Kong. The security law was passed and now Hong Kong, any element of democracy that was in Hong Kong, it's all gone now. They're they're now the one country, two systems approach has completely failed. And I I want to come back to Hong Kong when we start talking about Taiwan okay. here towards the end of the episode. Um, another another thing uh, under Xi's rule that's kind of characterized his thing have been these two words. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce them in Mandarin, but they translate to rejuvenation and reunification. And these two buzzwords have been real big in... Xi Jinping thought in in the reform movements and how the rejuvenation is how you know that's essentially a the Chinese equivalent to make America great again type deal, whereas unifi- reunification is explicitly about bringing Taiwan back into the fold. Again, we'll we'll go in a little bit more detail when we start talking specifically Taiwan, but kind of tying a lot of these different notes together is that she has reinvigorated a nationalistic approach to the CCP. And it's very much like, we're going to make China great again, and you need me to make that happen. So, so Jay, we kind of touched on an expanding authoritarian state that's characterized Xi's term in office now and right. Hong Kong as well and his absolute police crackdown. It's kind of ironic. You just go for, and then you go from uh, re, uh, rejuvenation and reunification. And now, meanwhile, in the Western part of China, there is what many would call a genocide going on with the Uyghurs. You know, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that is one of the defining, I guess, ongoing events of his, of his term and his term in office. Um, yeah. 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 Yes, real quick. I actually misspoke. My friend that I was referring, to, she's not from Xinjiang. She's from Xi'an, which so she's Han Chinese. She's not a Uyghur. But here we are talking about Xinjiang, which, like you said, Colin, is in the far western part. Just for our listeners, it's interesting. The China that we know today, in terms of its territorial borders, was very much a reflection of of the Qing Dynasty. Prior to the Qing and, and the Ming Dynasty, before that. China was probably about half the geographical size that it is now. This the area known as Xinjiang is a Muslim majority, a very large part. It's kind of it's in the far northwestern part of China. It's on the other side of Mongolia from from Beijing, north of Tibet, uh, and. The people that live there are called Uyghurs, and that's spelled U-Y-G-H-U-R-S in in English. So it looks like Uyghurs, but it's pronounced Uyghurs. And 
these these ethnic Uyghurs, like I said, they're a Muslim majority and they are fiercely independent. They're they're not communists. They don't want to be communists and they don't want to be ruled from, uh, com, you know, atheistic communist from uh, Han Chinese from Beijing. So they do a lot of things that's common across, you know, subjugated peoples over time. Uh, one calls an act of domestic terrorism. Another one calls an act of freedom fighting. And they, they're basically a persecuted people. And, you know, it's, I try to avoid hyperbole here in the podcast, but uh, what is what is going on in Xinjiang is nothing short of a genocide. Uh, there are, uh, to be fair, we don't have accurate numbers because the CCP does not allow a lot of international observation of what's going on, but there's been different reporting in the news about how there's essentially death camps like Holocaust style death camps going on in Xinjiang about, um, you know, putting all of these Uyghurs in camps and they're just dying by the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Uh, and it's, and it's sad because, you know, regardless of what your political affiliations are, like those are human beings and, you know, no human being deserves genocide. So, I bring this up to say, you know, the the theme and the thread that I wanted to draw in this episode is that Xi Jinping has brought the CCP, uh, the, he's moved it from the dang model of, hey, we're one country, we're one China, but we're going to allow certain levels of autonomy. You know, Tibet is technically an autonomous state. You know, Macau and Hong Kong are technically autonomous districts. There's actually another district in like central China, the name of it escapes me, that is technically autonomous. Um, but yet when you look at what party officials are doing there, it is not autonomy. It is, uh, you know, forced adherence to the party line. It is a prevention of religious practice, whether whether you're trying to follow the teachings of the Dalai Lama in Tibet, or if you're trying to you know, be a good Muslim up in Xinjiang. If you just want to be a, you know, a democratic liberal in Hong Kong, the party does not tolerate and you, you know, you can potentially die for, for trying to follow those things. So being unfortunate is putting it extremely mildly, but that's the that's the state of of what's going on there in Xinjiang and in the human rights issues that that we're facing. Man, tragic, it really yeah. is. You know, it's honestly, man, and you can keep this part if you want. Like, it's hard because, like, what do you do? You know, like we're not gonna be right for us to like go to war against China over what's going on in Xinjiang, right? Like. I'm not a, I can't think of a single precedent, you know, thinking about just war theory where you would like kill people to tell them that killing people is wrong. You know what I mean? We recognize that Xinjiang is part of the People's Republic of China. Like it's not even that we're doing like Taiwan where we just kind of don't comment. We acknowledge the CCP's position without taking a position ourselves. So it's like, what do you do? Like, there's no, there's no easy answer. And yeah, so that it's hard. It's no hard. easy way. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. What are two guys yeah. with the podcast going to do? Tell, every, <laughs> tell our listeners We're, we're going to tell it. you about it. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to correct the historical and political literacy here. And that's a great uh, way. It's a great plug. Well, so Jay, is there anything that's, that could slow them down? Are there any, are there any gaps that they have? Any weaknesses there? Or is this all? You know, does it seem like there's some facade? I know last week we mentioned that there's some uh, incongruities with the numbers that they report, especially when it comes to their economy. Yeah. yeah. And and not to recap too much about what we talked about in the last episode, because we really um, – almost the entire whole episode last week was about issues in the Chinese economy. But I do want to talk about some additional things that we didn't cover last week. The first one is the Belt and Road Initiative. and 
and this and this is an appropriate place to talk about it because the BRI was one of Xi's main foreign policy um, uh, and infrastructure things to really kind of spread like, okay, we've been receiving all of this foreign investment. Now we are going to be a main driver of investment in other countries. And it's it's been huge. Like there's tons of countries that have signed deals with the PRC for BRI. Uh, and can you break down what the BRI is? Like just conceptually, what is what is this that they're trying to accomplish here? Yeah. So the BRI is fundamentally a trade and infrastructure program where the CCP. So almost every single country in Africa, there's only one country and I'm not going to lie, guys, I don't even, I've never even heard of the country that, that has not signed a deal for, for BRI here. It is, uh, S Swatini, S Swatini. Maybe that's, is that might be one of those that's in South Africa. Anyway, Eswatini is the only African country that has not signed a deal with Chinese for BRI. And, and what it is, is China shows up, they'll sign this trade deal, but then they'll also say, hey, you country, Kenya, are going to pay Chinese construction companies to come in and build you a new airport. Or if you're in Djibouti, it's we're going to build you a new port. Or, uh, hey, we're going to build malls or like you name it, like roads, these infrastructure projects that then help facilitate Chinese goods to come into their country. Like uh, we talked about in the last episode, but China wants to maintain being an export market. Yeah. I think they call that the debt trap, debt trap policy that you just mentioned. Yes. Bingo. They come in with, they come in with a lot of money. And so what they'll, they'll do is they'll come in with Chinese banks, which are obviously run by the CCP, will come in and offer a lot of money to these developing nations. And it's not just in Africa. They're ha- it's happening now in South America. It's been happening in Central Asia for a better part of a decade now. But they come in, offer a lot of cash. And the terms are more favorable for the Chinese because the Chinese are banking that they will be unable to pay them, you know, to repay on the terms of the loan. So they'll get in this they'll get in a situation where they need to refi- you know like you can refinance on your house restructure a loan in order to pay it and that happens a lot of times between countries but then during that restructuring because China and these Chinese banks have all of the leverage the terms that they will there will be a lot of other concessions that are given in that China will have access to certain areas China will have first priority and so there's all of these other political favors that will be given you know for it's this debt trap. And there's been some back and forth and researching for this episode. I saw that there was some people that said, oh, well, it doesn't really exist and it's kind of overblown. But I mean, the reality is when they restructure all these, that is something that everyone says happens. And it's like a consensus of the restructuring happens and they have not seized assets, but that's because they're getting something, in my opinion, they're getting things in return that they wanted all along. Yeah. No, and that's a good segue to kind of talk about how the BRI is not doing so hot currently. And that is kind of similar to the housing market crisis and financial crisis here in the United States in 2008 or 2007, 2008, 2009. That was all based on subprime mortgages, i.e. banks were lending money to people they did not have any business lending money to to buy these outrageous homes. And there was all this debt that was piling up, piling up, piling up the house. And when people were buying houses, they couldn't afford that increases, you know, the value of these homes, it created a bubble and the bubble popped when people weren't able to pay back their mortgages. Well, if you're not able to pay back your mortgage, all of a sudden, you know, that creates second and third order of effects where these banks all of a sudden don't have the money because they're not getting paid back to go do future lending. And it has this cascading effect to where these all of these homes were going into foreclosure. So the price of the homes were going down. So nobody was making money off of 
selling their homes anymore, which means they couldn't pay their more like other mortgages back. And it oh, all kind of cascaded from there. I kind of want to do a side episode on the whole mortgage crisis because the cascading effect that you mentioned, I don't think people realize how deep it went or how deep it goes. Like when you pay interest yeah. on, on these loans, like you're basically paying somebody else. The bank is making in very basic terms, like if you were to go to your retirement fund, your 401k or something like that, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of different funds that you can invest in. A lot of times those funds, which you're gaining interest off of and you're, it's growing is off mm -hmm. of these loans and things like that. So when you default on a loan, it's not just like, oh, the bank lost money. It's like, oh, the bank lost money. And then everybody that the bank, that all these other people who have bought into other funds are losing money. So it's not even mm -hmm. like a cascading effect. It's almost like a house of cards just collapsing because you, if any, if there's like any point of failure the more complex these systems get, right. like the more catastrophic it will be. So when you talk about an international real estate market, which is basically what the Belt and Road Initiative is, like any point of hmm. failure can affect all of the other ones dramatically because right. suddenly, you know, it like we've talked about Evergrande Bank, if suddenly they can't make payments and they start defaulting on loans the banks that they owe money to start calling in their loans and seizing assets, they're going to then in turn call the banks that owe them money to try and come up with enough cash to to not default. And so then those banks, you know, and it, so that's kind of what happens. It's just banks start calling each other and they call in all these loans because at that point right. you owe them money. Wow. Long, long, t long tangent to say that's part of what's going on in China's economy right now, or it's on the precipice and they're trying to avoid yeah. it from happening. Yeah. So, you know, in China financed a lot of these BRI projects with their own debt. And what, you know, we talked about this last week that is China might actually be insolvent, i.e., they themselves may not be able to pay off their own debt, much less the debt that they've, you know, issued to other countries. So if those other countries can't pay off that debt, that just makes the current debt crisis even worse over, over there. It's kind of an interesting thought. So, Jay. And I'm freestyling here. I'm going off the notes. Uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative, was their objective not just economic, but also cultural domination as well? Kind of like the, like we've talked about it before, where the kowtow, performing the kowtow to China. Yeah. And so, like when you come in and you build all of this great infrastructure projects, like there's a, there's a great book called The New Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan, and he kind of talks about, and this was pre-COVID when he wrote it. So it was like in the middle of the the big push and the, the Belt and Road Initiative. But he talks about these bridges and these highways that are being built over the Mongolian corridor and then through Kazakhstan and Russia and all these other places. That's Chinese influence, and that's kind of their way of winning them over from the Americans. Do you think that was one of the one of the risks that they were willing to take and say, like, hey, this is kind of a very risky financial decision, but it's something we need to do to break their influence away from the Americans and kowtow yeah. to the Chinese? Yeah, absolutely. There's there there's definitely an aspect to BRI where it's like, hey. We are we China are are a better alternative to you than the United States and the West. We can give you a better deal, and we can, you know, we're a better partner, both in business deals in in all these in all these different areas. So, yeah, like in terms of culture, like the the nationalist chinese side very much views chinese culture as unique and superior very very similar to you know russians or even nationalists here in the united states like it's this idea you know my culture is superior therefore it's really just a matter of time before uh, other people recognize it as such type deal good point yeah i tend to agree with that um, just for the sake of time, so there's a, there's another thing here that's worth mentioning, and that's the demographic issues mm. uh, within within China now, all due to the one child policy. We haven't really covered this before. Oh man, I'm kind of surprised we didn't. I think we it's a good time to bring it up because it kind of spans this week and last week. But mm. there, the one child policy, and Jay, I don't know about you, but I felt like growing up in America, when I would hear about this, it was very much a, oh, they just can only have one kid. Like it was a very sterile type of understanding. It's just like, oh, well, they're only allowed to have one kid over there. 
I watched a in it. I watched a really good documentary called uh, One Child Nation. It was it was done by she is like a Chinese expat. She grew up during that that era, and her family lived in a rural area in China, like during the start of the one child policy. And she, like her family, was actually allowed to have a second child, which was like super rare. But she wanted to go back to China and interview all these families and just kind of do a kind of humanize it, if you will. You know, because we can kind of look at the numbers and I'll get into that in a second, but she sort of humanized it. But this one child policy absolutely decimated China demographically. Um, if you think about all the episodes we've talked about where we've had two opium wars, we've had the Taiping Rebellion, which 20 million people died in 14 years. There's the Boxer Rebellion. There was uh, – all sorts of civil war, a warlord era, then the Japanese invasion where millions died. Then you had the communist, the the great leap forward and the cultural revolution where they think tens of millions of people died and their population still went up. But it wasn't until they this one child policy that their population has peaked. And now what's about to happen, if you look at it, they, because there are, I think the number is 110 males for every 100 females. If you really look at that into the like sub 40, you know, 20 to 40 demographic, it's probably even worse than that because those are really the only ones that can actually have kids and they're only allowed two. So those are, that's going to be your population in another 40 years and their kids below them. So if you have 110 males and only 100 females, 10 men cannot have children. So no matter what, those 10 men can't have children. And so basically they're going to die and not repopulate more or less. And that's assuming that every other male and every other female has a child, has two children just to replace it. So you're going to see this kind of inversion of the the population column, and you're going to have an increasing or a shrinking population having to support an aging population. And that is going to really put them in a pinch because they're no longer going to be able to fund this these growth projects that they have because this population is going to age out and they're not going to have kids to support them. And the population who's retiring is not going to have enough people coming in to support them. And especially in a communist country where you rely on such a heavy tax burden. But I do want to go back to how that that kind of unevenness of men and women happened. You know, if you watch this documentary, you do any reading on your own, but you see like in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, Chinese culture always valued male heirs and basically a male firstborn more than they valued women. So you would have families who would have selective sex abortions. They would, but and then a lot of them were forced. And so that was part of the thing yeah. I didn't realize. A lot of it was yeah. the government coming in and for, they were forced sterilizing. Forced abortions. Forced were abortions. A thing. Yeah. You know, it's kind of it's the opposite of what we talk about here. It's like, well, you know, women, you know, we want to support women's right to choose. Well, there it was like they didn't have a choice to, to have a kid and it was going to be imposed on them. So, it was kind of an inversion of what the debate is here about abortion where it was forced on them. Sterilization was forced on them. And if they had a girl, a lot of times they would give them up for adoption or they would just abandon them on the street. And so, the US, there was a big push for like foreign born adoptions, I think in the 90s and early 2000s. And it was almost like a black market that was going on in China where they would like forge paperwork. They would just have people walk around on the streets and pick up abandoned girls who were basically not wanted and because of this policy given up for adoption in the US and most of their paperwork was forged. So it really humanized it and you see that it wasn't just, oh, they can only have one kid. It was like the government is imposing sterilization and abortion on you and you have to kind of fit this antiquated – culture that you have into it to have a boy. And so that now we're looking at it 40 years later where there's too many men, there's not enough people in general, and what that's going to spell for them in 2050 where their population might even get down to a billion people, where they're at almost a billion five now, it might get as low as a billion there and it's, it's going to be aging. So yeah. real, real problem for them. Yeah. 2022 was the first year that China's uh, population actually declined. And, you know, there's a lot of experts that believe, um, uh, actually, no, it was this year. India 
actually came back and has surpassed uh, China now again as the most populous country in the world. So, yeah, there's there's big demographic issues, and it's more than just what the total number is. Khan, I think you mentioned like when you have a lot of older and less productive citizens and you have significantly fewer children who can then be productive, but yet the state is still expected to provide for those elderly. And it's an extremely Confucian thing to like, you take care of your parents type deal as they get older. Um, yeah, like I don't, I don't think that we've we have fully felt the effects and the problems that are going to come from, uh, you know, a a hourglass figure demographic chart, if that makes any sense. So, wouldn't even necessarily be hourglass. Part of the problem with anything, any of these policies, where I think Xi was the one that put a stop to it in 2015, and he increased it to two. Well, if you try and arrest the rate of descent of something, which it's like their population we're seeing now is declining, well, it's not just going to overnight say, "Oh, you can have two kids," and it, it pops back up. Yeah, like that is going to continue to descent because it's going to create decades. all these decades, and because it's creating all these other problems that you mentioned and economic issues, where it's like, well. I, I can't have I can't even have one kid. I can't even find yeah. a spouse. So it's like that population yeah. is going to go way down a lot quicker and I don't think a lot of people in China are ready for it. Yeah. No. Agreed. All right. So for the sake of time, let's move on to the last big issue and that is uh what is the current state of play regarding Taiwan and you know what does what does the foreseeable future look like? My my personal opinion of it all is that I think we here within the United States would be doing ourselves a disservice by trying to encourage any kind, uh, you know, encourage any kind of like Taiwanese independence movement. I think we've talked about before. There's two main political parties within Taiwan. There's the the KMT, the Kuomintang, and the DPP, the Democratic People's Party. Uh, the current party in office is DPP, and they lean more towards uh, independence slash keeping their distance from the PRC, whereas the KMT is kind of seen in general terms a little bit more about, no, let's work with the CCP. Let's actually bring our two countries together, although exactly how that is going to happen, exactly what that looks like is, is a little blurry. With with those considerations in mind, um, I I think we would we would like I said doing a, a disservice to encourage D, DPP like independence only because that would in fact be a departure from our policy. Our policy with you know the one China policy is, you know we have we recognize the PRC, we recognize that there is one China. We acknowledge the PRC's claim over Taiwan, and we agree to not or you know limit uh, arms sales in some way to Taiwan. Even though I think even here recently we've been doing some some diplomatic gymnastics to get to get around those kinds of things. So honestly, status quo is infinitely preferable to I think any other options. And the problem is, is that the longer someone like Xi, Xi Jinping stays in power, the less likely the status quo looks like it, it's going to be. And what I mean by that is, you know, Xi Jinping has kind of hung his hat on rejuvenation and reunification and making China great again. And that includes you know, bring in Taiwan back into the fold. With Hong Kong, and I mentioned this earlier, the problem is, is that what we've seen in Hong Kong is that Xi Jinping doesn't actually believe in Deng's mantra of one country, two systems. He didn't allow Hong Kong to have its own system. So if I was Taiwan, that was the worst possible thing that she could have done to Hong Kong it would have been like, oh shoot, I never want to reunify with the mainland because I just watched what you did to Hong Kong and I don't want any part of that. I like my freedoms over here. I like having my own democratic system. I like my police not welding my door shut because of, you know, 
whatever policy that the CCP might have. So I think Xi's crackdown on Hong Kong did more long-term damage to to reunifying with Taiwan than any other thing during his regime, for sure. Okay. And with that brief little tidbit on Taiwan, I think that about sums up on this episode. But just to kind of rehash what our main points here was, you know, the last these 11 years under Xi Jinping have been one of increasing authoritarianism, tragedy in different areas like Hong Kong and Xinjiang, and in an in a increasingly confrontational approach with the U.S. Stay tuned, folks. You know, we'll see what happens. Honestly, never wish conflict between two countries, but unfortunately it happens. And you know, hoping that it never happens isn't usually a good way to prevent it doesn't happen or prevent it from happening. Just ask Neville Chamberlain. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's all I have for this. That's great. Yeah. Jay, as always, it was a fantastic episode. Great to talk about G and you know, for our listeners out there next week, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at the key themes of what we've talked about from the opium wars all the way to today. And we're going to take those themes and what we've talked about and do what most historians hate to do is, is make projections and, and kind of use it to look forward and, and take a look at what some of China's future initiatives are going to be, where we where we see the war or the war. Yeah. Speaking of war, there potentially could be a conflict over Taiwan where the world would be between China and the United States and what all that entails. And that'll be next week's episode, but we hope you enjoyed this week. As always, give us a like, a follow, five-star ratings. If you give that plus a comment so we can see who you are, we'll give you a shout out on the episode. Jay and I are both on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, all of that. We even have an email if you want to reach out. It's all at Moines of History and different variations of that. So as always, we appreciate you and we hope to have you listen to us again. Thank you. 